Welcome to Data Byte 140. My name is Alex Rosenblatt. I'm a senior researcher at Data and Society, and I will be your host for tonight alongside my team behind the scenes, CJ, Eli, and Rigo. For those of you who don't know us yet, Data and Society is an independent research institute studying the social implications of data and automation. We produce original research and regularly convene multidisciplinary thinkers to challenge the power and purpose of technology in society. We will be spending the next hour together, so let's get ourselves grounded. Data and Society was founded in Lenape King, the historic land of the Leni Lenape people, a network of rivers and islands located in the Atlantic Northeast, we now refer to as New York City. Today, we are connected via a vast array of servers and computers around the world, facilitated by the dispossession of indigenous land acquired through the logic of white settler expansion. We uplift the sovereignty of indigenous people, data and territory, and commit to dismantling ongoing practices of colonialism and its material implications on our digital worlds. You'll notice a link in the chat, native-land.ca, that directs you to more information about occupied lands. If you haven't already, use the chat feature to share your location. And now it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you to our speaker for today, my longtime friend and colleague, David Robinson, who is currently a visiting scientist in the AI Policy and Practice Initiative in Cornell's College of Computing and Information Science. His research centers on the design and management of algorithmic decision-making, particularly in the public sector. He believes that effective governance of these socio-technical systems will require collaboration and mutual adaptation by the legal and technical communities, leading to changes in both institutional and algorithmic design, as well as the generation and use of new types of data. Through his work, he aims to contribute to that effort. See a link in the chat to David's website to learn more about his truly fascinating work. Welcome, David. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks, Alex. Let's get started. Thank you, everyone, for joining today. I, ju I just saw in the chat that Professor Oscar Gandhi is with us, and I'm deeply honored, Professor, to have you uh, 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 joining us today. Your work is an inspiration to, uh, to my own uh, efforts. Uh, let me go ahead and try and share my slides. Rules implemented in software, deciding things that are both technically intricate and ethically fraught are more and more common. Situations where there are no perfect answers. People uh, have been calling in, in policy and in academic circles for the public to better understand and to shape many of these rules. Could be when someone's arrested, uh, how should their level of quote unquote dangerousness uh, be defined if at all unmeasured, or if someone has a disability, how much and what kind of public assistance do they need? Uh, which news updates should be routed to a particular person? Which sources can be trusted? There are a lot of debates happening about whether and how lay people can understand and can have a voice in shaping systems like these. And the reason that I care about the story that we're going to explore together today is because it shows us that meaningful lay involvement is possible and illustrates conditions that are conducive to such involvement. So today's question isn't so much which systems need the kind of engagement by lay people that is demonstrated here. Instead, the question is what can that engagement look like in practice and what can we learn from it? So I'm going to begin with a story, then tell you about uh, tech, the, the, the challenge of kidney transplantation uh, and kidney disease. Uh, then we're going to look at a remaking of the algorithm, a rewriting over a 10-year period of the algorithm that determines who gets a kidney in the United States. And lastly, we're going to explore what I would suggest are some lessons that could be learned from this experience. But if you only remember one thing, it would be this, I hope, that technology constantly sparks new ethical questions and that technologists need not answer those questions alone. So our story begins at this airport Marriott in Dallas, Texas on a chilly day in February of 2007. There's an all day meeting taking place in the basement ballroom, hundreds of people who are involved in kidney transplantation, surgeons, 
nurses, social workers, transplant recipients, and living donors. Because of course, unlike uh, hearts, for instance, most of us have two kidneys, and yet a single kidney is enough to keep a person in good health. So there are many living donors for, for kidney transplants. Right now, uh, it's just after lunch, and Clive Graw, a 54-year-old uh, traffic engineer from Los Angeles, is speaking. He's the first person to be neither a medical doctor nor a PhD. He has a rare genetic disease called polycystic kidney disease, which means that over time his kidneys break down and uh, he'll need a new one. What the meeting is about is a, an effort to revise the nationwide algorithm that matches kidneys from deceased donors to waiting patients. Today, there are more than 100,000 people waiting for kidney transplant in the US. The algorithm coordinates approximately 15,000 transplants each year. It's often called a waiting list, but actually it's not a first come first serve queue. It's a matching process that incorporates medical, ethical and logistical factors in deciding who uh, will be offered each organ. Um, this has been done by a nationwide algorithm, a nationwide piece of software for more than 30 years. And this meeting in Dallas taking place in 2007 is midway through what turned out to be a 10 year saga that rewrote the algorithm. So I think this is a very interesting situation and it's one that incorporates in real practice many governance proposals that are frequently proffered today uh, including, uh, for instance, um, community input, transparency, simulating the consequences of a, of a decision logic. Uh, there's auditing after the fact. Um, so the question is that animates our, our time together today is what can we learn from this? The proposal that Clive Graw incidentally is responding to is that uh, the organ should be allocated to maximize the amount of life years that are saved. Uh, and uh, that's a very intuitively appealing idea for many. But Mr. Graw uh, argues that for someone who knows that they're going to need a kidney later in life, uh, that could be a perverse regime because in effect, it could punish him for not being young when he needs uh, a kidney for having taken good care of himself. And the same is true for his, his daughters who unfortunately inherited uh, the same condition. And after his appeal that pointed this out, the attempt to use a purely uh, benefit-based, a life year maximizing algorithm was abandoned after this meeting. But first, let's get some context on this challenge. Ethical challenges depend on what our technologies make possible. And as the technologies change, new moral challenges can come up that we need to respond to. And our answers might change over time as the horizon of what is possible also changes. Kidney transplant beautifully illustrates all of this. And it actually begins, this moral challenge begins uh, with Teflon, the introduction of Teflon, the synthetic nonstick surface in the early 1960s. What you're looking at here uh, is a diagram from a 1960 paper that described the invention of a Teflon shunt so that someone could repeatedly have their blood circulated through an external machine, believe it or not, and because one of the key functions of kidneys is to remove toxins from the blood. Um, and uh, dialysis first was attempted in World War II in Nazi-occupied Holland, uh, and it worked quite well, except that getting blood in and out of the patient was, was difficult. And every time that they would do dialysis, they would need a different place to put the needle. So they, they could only do it for about a month. But after this Teflon shunt was introduced, uh, it became possible to dialyze the same person repeatedly uh, indefinitely, which was a tremendous breakthrough. It basically turned kidney failure into what could be a chronic rather than a fatal uh, disease. But Dr. Belding Scribner in Washington State, who invented this device, only had four dialysis machines. He and his staff were overwhelmed by desperate patients and their doctors. And doctors, of course, fight for the life of each patient. And so rationing care, deciding which of their patients should get access to a life-saving machine is not a very comfortable role for most physicians. Really, that's an ethical question. And uh, Scribner, decided to resolve that question of who should get the scarce machines by creating a committee, which you see depicted here. 
doctors would say who's medically eligible. And then these lay people uh, would pick from among the medically eligible patients. This did not go over well with the public. It was seen as too ad hoc. Uh, the evidence about this committee suggested that they liked men who were income earners with families to support. A couple of scholars uh, memorably wrote that the Pacific Northwest is no place for a Henry David Thoreau with bad kidneys. Um, so there's lots to dislike about this approach, but there is also something profoundly honest about it that says te the technology of dialysis, of cleaning the blood might be complex, but the hard ethical choices belong to a wider community and not only to the technical experts. And by the way, in order to get the ethical input that we need, it is necessary to bring lay people into the fold to get them up to speed about what these choices really are. But even, even with this happening, the best way to solve kidney failure remained transplantation. So, uh, the, while dialysis was developing, transplant uh, developed uh, uh, around the same time. Believe it or not, the physical act of surgically transplanting a kidney is something that was really resolved in the early 1900s, how to go about it. The really hard part is if you take an organ from one body and put it in another, the recipient's immune system tends to reject the organ as foreign and attack it. And so the very first, uh, uh, long-term success with kidney transplantation was between identical twins. And this meant they didn't, of course, if you have a transplant inside of you, you don't have to spend 12 hours a week hooked up to a machine. You don't have to constantly yo-yo between a feeling of health and a feeling of toxicity, toxicity and lethargy. Um, so this was great, but for, for a while, it seemed you could only do this with very close family members or ideally, as in this case, identical twins. But then in the early 1980s, the introduction of a new drug called cyclosporin changed this situation completely. It could suppress the immune system of the person receiving a transplant so that someone could get a kidney transplant from a stranger that could work for many years, potentially. Now, there were still a bunch of factors that would influence how likely a transplant was to succeed and for how long, including that there would need to be compatible blood type between the donor and recipient. And there were still conflicts between the immune system of the recipient and the proteins on the, on the kidney, that, which are known as antigens because they spark an immune response. Um, but on the whole, many, many people could be a suitable recipient for the same kidney, and that created uh, a real logistical and moral question about who would get the organ. So at first, a process called tissue typing played a very important role in deciding who would be offered which kidney. And this was basically an effort to, de to detect which, uh, which proteins each recipient would react against and to prioritize to receive each kidney people whose immune system was unlikely to reject that kidney. Uh, but one of the, one of the things uh, that was observed uh, in all of this was that uh, the proteins were, that, that were causing these reactions were correlated to some extent with race and so with a much higher burden of kidney disease in the African-American community, uh, be partly due uh, to uh, significant social determinants of health. So things like uh, that cause uh, kidney disease include things like environmental stress and diabetes and obesity that are, are differentially present uh, in different communities. And so there's a, about a triple rate of kidney failure in the uh, African American, as in the as in the the white uh, community in the United States, so much more need. But uh, the biological tests that they were using to forecast how long a, a transplant would last tended to uh, tended not always, but in general, had had a, a somewhat of an effect of a thumb on the scale toward uh, same race matching of uh, of kidneys, and of course the donor pool resembled the overall population. So there was a real disconnect there. Um, there are a number of uncertainties that you might have about this. Factually, how much does antigen matching uh, aid survival? And similarly, 
how much does this antigen matching process disadvantage underrepresented minorities in receiving organs? And then once you've got all the facts, there's some, uh, some kind of a normative trade-off involved. How much does the survival and the disparity, how much does each of those factors matter and how to trade off between them? So what happened over time was that uh, the role of this, of this protein matching process decreased um, and we can go into, this is one of a, a, a number of things we can go deeper into if, if people have questions. But just to take a step back, this process of transplants with strangers, how did this develop? So up at the top of your screen, this is the National Organ Transplantation Act, which was passed in 1984, shortly after stranger transplants became medically feasible. And so then there's a panel, this says, this says, of course, establish a national system through the use of computers and in accordance with established medical criteria to match organs and individuals included in the list, i.e. an algorithm. So then there's a panel uh, that is uh, brought together to figure out how that algorithm ought to work. And it says criteria for prioritization should be developed by a broadly representative group. And then lastly, this is the current uh, uh, bylaws of the organization that makes these rules says that transplant candidates, recipients, organ donors, and their family members must be represented and must hold at least a quarter of the seats on this board that approves uh, the algorithm. Um, and by the way, there's a whole governance process with notice and comment, with proposed changes, the rule is transparent, annually extensive data is published about who's getting transplants and who's not and which parts of the different rules are causing people to get or to not get transplants. But circa 2003, although race equity has been improved somewhat, uh, from an earlier baseline, the system is extremely complicated. What you're seeing here is a quarter of it, and it's not making best use of the organs in the sense that uh, it would often happen that a, a much older recipient would receive a younger and healthier kidney, and a younger, healthier recipient would receive uh, an older and, and, uh, and less robust kidney, which meant that they would likely need a second transplant later. So there were, there were some opportunities for uh, greater efficiency that were clearly being missed, and the system had become complicated and hard to understand even with all the transparency. So how did they make the, the new algorithm? I'm about to summarize a decade of debate in a few minutes. Um, there are a number of other changes uh, that I'm not going to highlight here that include transplant across blood types and a change in how waiting time is calculated, but the central debate, the big question, in this decade of debate was how to balance between maximizing benefit and making the system fair. Here's a cover image from 2009 near the midpoint of the debate from the leading journal of transplant medicine. And um, there were a series of different, three different proposals uh, over time that were seriously considered for the new kidney allocation algorithm. The first one, Lift is the one we saw uh, Mr. Graw, the traffic engineer, arguing against at the beginning of our story. And what this graph depicts is how much benefit in added survival do transplant candidates get given different ages of the candidate. The distance between these lines at left shows how much uh, added survival you get if the uh, recipient is a young person and over here, how much added survival you get if the recipient is an old person. And so if you maximize uh, life years from transplant, then uh, basically you end up giving to younger and also healthier uh, recipients with fewer comorbidities. And so here, what you can see is the results of a simulation that the scientific registry of transplant recipients uh, did. This is a separate body, not the people who administer the algorithm, but a separate auditing and analysis group. It's a different uh, uh, nonprofit organization that plays this role. So the pink was the old rules. The uh, light blue here uh, was the new rules. And this is on the bottom, the age de decade of the people who would get kidneys. And, and what you can see here um, on this slide is that the fraction of transplants going to people in their 20s would triple. Uh, and the uh, fraction for people over 50 would approximately fall in half. Um, so this was a, 
the the admirable clarity around the age impact of this proposal led the community and um, the committees that were looking at this to reject the proposal. Uh, second, we had a proposal called 2080 that used something called longevity matching. So basically what they said was, um, let's. there was a problem before of some people would have much worse chances of getting a kidney under the lift proposal. So now what we're going to do is say, everyone has the same chance of getting a kidney as they had under the old system. And we're just going to change who gets which kidney. And the youngest, healthiest 20% of kidneys, we are going to give to the youngest, healthiest group of potential recipients. Um, and then for the rest of the organs, we're going to age match so that someone who's in their 50s gets a kidney from uh, a donor in their 50s and so on. This was a much simpler system, much easier to understand, uh, but it was ultimately rejected as being uh, age discriminatory to have that age matching piece. Thirdly and finally, the proposal that we live under today uh, got rid of age matching for that bottom 80% and went back mostly to uh, waiting time. Uh, the, and the rules were different for these KDPI numbers. That's the quality of kidneys. So there were four different basically quality grades of kidneys that each have a different sequence. Um, and by the way, they changed the way that waiting time was calculated. It used to be you would get extra credit for how long you had been waiting, which is only one of the factors, uh, based on how, when you were first added to the list, the transplant list. But they realized that this really rewarded people for having access to health care and punished people who had less access to care. And so they changed uh, this system so that uh, you would get waiting time from the time you started to need dialysis which is a more objective medical indicator uh, of medical need, as opposed to when were you able to get yourself listed. Um, and so in the new system, um, one thing you see here is uh, that the waiting time calculation, there was, there was a large population of people with less healthcare access who had gotten onto the list later in the course of their disease and got a tremendous boost from the uh, change so that uh, the fraction, this is basically the per person likelihood of getting uh, a transplant. And you can see that the uh, racial uh, gap uh, between candidates of different races in their unit likelihood of receiving a transplant in any given month greatly narrowed after 2014 when the new um, when the new rules were implemented. So I thought that was the story that I had for you, a pretty clean, pretty simple story about uh, this deliberative process leading to this incremental improvement in the algorithm. But then I encountered a surprise twist, and that was the lawsuit uh, filed by Miriam Holman in, I believe it was 2016. So what you're looking at here is the map of the catchment areas, the zones in which transplants are gathered and first distributed. And basically what, um, what Miriam argued, she was in New York City and needed a lung, but because New Jersey's a different zone, someone quite close to her who was an, or a, a lung donor, uh, because of the lung rules, would um, potentially that lung would go to someone further away from the donor, somewhere in, in New Jersey, just because it's in a different zone, uh, than to Miriam in New York City who needed uh, it. And of course, unlike kidneys and dialysis, if you need a lung, it's life and death immediately. Um, and so she basically said, these geographic borders um, are arbitrary, that everything is based on, including the kidney allocation. And in this 10-year process, geography wasn't discussed hardly at all in the thousands of pages of material I read and in the uh, series of interviews that I did with people who were involved in this process. And indeed, that same data analysis group, what this is, is a, is a look at factors that are not supposed to matter to how likely you are to get a kidney. So for instance, here's education, here's age, here's ethnicity. Um, and the one that's this largest bar, the factor that makes the largest difference that shouldn't make a difference is donation service area. That's which geographic zone you are in. And so uh, Miriam uh, files her suit, I'm sorry, in November of 2017. And within days, 
uh, the courts force uh, the, the uh, organ transplantation network to eliminate its geographic zones. So whereas much smaller changes were, de were debated for a decade, uh, this transformation of the system using concentric proximity circles around the hospitals where the donations are um, was implemented in less than a week. And you can see here, this is for kidneys that um, the median wait time across groups of states varies by more than a, a factor of two. Um, and so this, what this I think shows us is that uh, morally important uh, differences can be off stage when we're having these detailed debates about algorithms. And this was an illustration of that. So I'll quickly just give you a few of the takeaways uh, that I th that I am left with, and I'm eager to hear what impressions and questions uh, you are left with by this material. One thing is, as I was saying, algorithms direct our moral attention. So um, this dial between favoring basically maximum benefit by transplanting into young and healthy people who have the most to gain versus fairness of giving everyone an equal chance, there's a dial you can turn. And we saw that in these progressive different versions of the algorithm. But there are other things off stage, like what about these geographic zones that no one had the political will to reconsider during the algorithm development process? Or how do people get onto the list in the first place? It turns out that many people without strong access to healthcare never end up getting listed for transplants, even when they could benefit from it. Uh, and by the way, this whole process and algorithm are about addressing the shortage of kidneys to transplant into waiting patients. But what about things that could remove that shortage? Things like, uh, for instance, um, uh, artificial kidneys that are implantable, which is something that's being worked on actually just a few miles from here at UCSF, uh, or transplants from animals, which again is something that uh, people are researching actively. Um, the second lesson that I, I, I took from this process is that debate creates opinion. I, I think we often treat public input as if it were out there waiting for us to go detect with some kind of a opinion detecting procedure or machine. But what happened in this case, uh, as I read the evidence, is that in hearing one another out, stakeholders gradually developed a shared belief in the legitimacy of the long and costly deliberations in which they were all engaged. In the end, over a 10-year period of learning and debate, a community of people changed its mind about uh, what was reasonable to do and gradually converged on uh, some sense of agreement. For instance, after the lift proposal, community feedback decisively rejected a pure focus on maximizing total benefit. And when that extreme was ruled out, the window of acceptable policies was narrower and the debate focused on how to improve benefit without radically reducing anyone's access, any group of patients' access to organs. And I don't want to sugarcoat this, consensus was not achieved, as I think it never could be in a situation where not getting a kidney can mean uh, death, right? The risks from, from dialysis remain high uh, uh, for every patient. It's not that consensus was achieved so much as a kind of earned mutual acquiescence to a particular set of values compromises. People were sort of worn down until they were ready to accept the inevitably imperfect compromise that they had played a hand in creating and that uh, was arrived at. Um, a third lesson, experts are critical. We can talk all we like about transparency, but transparency all the way to the level of understanding requires more than just disclosure. It requires expertise. Even with lots of transparency, there's a ton to learn and firsthand knowledge of how these systems work is not something that can be replaced by any set of documents. Take it from me, having gone swimming in the voluminous documentary record, conversations with participants were an irreplaceable catalyst for me and even beginning to understand how these processes work. And finally, um, the shared process of the, of the analysis function here from the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients uh, created 
a sense of shared awareness about how the system was working and about how proposed changes might impact the system. And that, I think, enabled an informed debate to unfold. I think without some shared sense by some trusted analyst, you would have ended up forcing uh, debate participants to reinvent the wheel on an extremely effort intensive. And these, you know, they do every year hundreds of pages of reports. And, you know, this, for instance, this figure was the 13th in a list of 30 such, you know, analyses that they published in the year that uh, I was looking at. So with that, let me just come back to that one thing that I'm hoping will emerge from this, which is that even though technology does constantly spark new ethical questions, tech, uh, technologists, engineers, the technical folks do not need to answer those questions alone. And with that, I'll uh, thank you and let's uh, turn to discussion. Thank you so much, David. That was a remarkably interesting presentation. I'm thrilled to hear it. I've been eager to learn more about this project since you discussed it with me long ago, and I'm so glad to hear it come to fruition. I have a couple of questions to start us off, but then I will turn to the audience Q&A. Um, you described a deliberate process for inching progress in stranger transplants around Miriam Holman's case, but her case also demonstrates how personal narratives and legal interventions can accelerate changes to transplant governance structures such as by challenging the arbitrary legacy conditions over lung geography. I wonder if you could comment just a little bit more on the lessons we can take away from this remarkable history of multi-stakeholder processes and how we can apply it to present political challenges over governing algorithms. Well, I think, yeah, that's a really interesting question. One of the things that's true about any kind of a new process that we set up like uh, creating a new committee to publicly give input, whether it's transplant algorithms or courtroom or whatever, um, is that it's ultimately subject to the intervention of the, uh, of, the, of the rest of the power structure. So a court can come in and force a change or a legislature can come in and say, well, we created this committee, but now we're revising its mandate. Uh, or you know the executive branch can can say well you know we're we're interpreting this differently um, and so ultimately all of those other levers of power are still going to be present and I think that uh, one of the balancing acts if you're in a committee situation they try to achieve consensus so hard partly because if they don't have agreement then whoever lost uh, can go look for another of these ways. Uh, to intervene. And I think, so, so the idea that we can predict with total confidence which bureaucratic mechanism is really going to resolve the values debate, I, I, I think this cautions us against that. Thank you. Uh, one of the things that fascinated me in your astonishing history of stranger transplants is how social justice was centered in this governance multi-stakeholder debate. Uh, for example, there are real medical differences at the population level between people we group into different racial groups, and that affects kidney matching for marginalized populations. I wonder if you might further comment on how we can best continue to center social justice issues in questions of algorithmic governance today. Well, yeah, it's, it's interesting because, so that antigen matching is, is such an interesting case. Um, where it turned out, so if you have a perfect match like identical twins, it's still the case today that that confers a tremendous increase in the likely length of success of a transplant. But for levels of compatibility that are somewhere in the middle, the evidence is much more equivocal about whether it makes a difference at all. And I think for the doctors involved, there was a temptation to say, oh, we're just going to use this medical fact to decide who gets the next organ. It's sort of um, resolved for them a tension that is a very undoctor-like thing they might otherwise have to do, which is make an explicit ethical judgment about, you know, who should come first. And so there's sort of this desire to invest, in some cases, these medical facts with a greater clinical significance than they may in fact possess. But I, I, I do think also that this is a, a situation where 
the lived experiences of the people who are in the transplant system play an important role. So for instance, the people, the, the transplant physicians who drove these changes to de-emphasize antigen matching, uh, many of them were uh, African-American physicians and, 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 and uh, transplant nurses and others. And so um, I think that you know, rep representation matters and that the debate over which factors are relevant and for instance, does does a community level difference in representation matter? If if you know if a single physician is saying, well, each of my patients is as important as any other, I think from that point of view, and I I encountered some of this in interviews, there's a limited patience with this kind of group level analysis because I think to some it seems to smack of differentiating how much we value different lives, and of course people who you know would argue for such 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 thought would say, well, we already act as if different lives had different value. And so we have to be aware of it in order to, to respond to it. I mean, I think that, that that debate is very much a part of the transplant conversation. Thank you. I'm gonna to turn to questions from the audience. Our first one is from Betsy Cooper. Thank you so much for joining us, Betsy. Uh, and she writes, I can't help but think about the upcoming COVID-19 vaccine distribution and how algorithms may play a role in determining who gets one first. Any lessons to share from this case of kidney transplants that might inform the vaccine distribution? That's a great question. <laughs> and thanks, Betsy, for, for tuning in. I, um, I think that uh, explicitness is valuable. I think it allows us to understand the trade-offs that are involved. Um, you know, there are different reasons why you might prioritize different groups, healthcare workers and the medically vulnerable. Uh, I think uh, vaccine risks are maybe a little less acute, like waiting a month to receive a vaccine can of course make a life and death difference. But when, when I compare that to like, do you get a, a heart that you need as a transplant or not, or uh, the more acute care question of rationing ventilators, I do think that um, there's a little, I think a little more of a kind of sense of time to be deliberate when it comes to rationing vaccine vaccine doses. But I, I, I would just say that explicitness is really valuable. And I've been comforted to see a, 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 a significant amount of, of different healthcare authorities, different countries saying, you know, here's who we're putting first and why. It seems that there is something in common with vaccine distribution and the use of dialysis as a safety net for renal failure against the questions of urgency and priority in receiving a transplant. Our next yeah. question is from Kelly Owens. She says, thanks for this great talk. I'm wondering if you could speak a bit more about how these types of algorithms or systems can be gamed and how that can affect equity. As you mentioned briefly, savvy doctors know how to get their patients on transplant lists long before they need transplant. Um, and try to game the system to do that. How do policymakers and developers think about gaming when creating these kinds of algorithms? Yeah, well, so gaming is such an interesting word because it carries this normative charge. Like gaming is behavior change that gets you an advantage that you're not supposed to get. And so part of, I think, a debate about gaming is where do we draw the line between acceptable and unacceptable ways of seeking a transplant? And I'll give you a concrete example. Um, in the federal law, the National Organ Transplantation Act, there's a protected right for each patient to be listed in multiple geographic zones. And so if you're at the top end, the really, really top end of wealth and resources and means, you can pay to have the extensive, call it $100,000 workup done in hospitals in a half dozen different ju jurisdictions, and then fly wherever you get an organ first. And this is something, so for instance, uh, Steve Jobs went, I think, to Arizona as a famous example, recent famous example of um, someone, uh, you know, going where they needed to go to be on the right list, whereas most patients, and particularly patients of social disadvantage, you know, they're going to list, uh, if at all, in the place where they live, and they're not in a position to, to move. And so that's an example where, you know, that's not considered gaming, because it's not against the rules, because that's what the rules are, they let you multi list, 
uh, but I think the rules, the rules themselves are, one might argue, uh, un un unfair in that way. Thank you. From Catherine Strauss, we have a question about how much visibility, if any, patients get into the algorithm. Is there transparency around the decision factors and weights that are shared with patients and their families? Oh boy, is there ever. There's as much transparency, if you mean disclosure, there's as much of that as you could possibly want, I think, uh, including exactly what the formulas are. And by the way, they're formulas on top of formulas on top of formulas because each kidney has a quality score that's itself a prediction about how long that kidney is going to last. And then they group the kidneys by quality level and have different allocation systems for qu different quality tiers. Uh, and then uh, there are different uh, lists. So, so basically, every time a kidney becomes available, there's a match run that's looking at, OK, who's listed? who either if they have the right amount of immune matching or they're nearby, there's kind of this, this whole complicated series. And so if you recall that tree with all those leaves on it of different rules that I displayed earlier, it can be very difficult to translate, you know, the five page single spaced list of different rules into a kind of gestalt sense of where the kidneys are actually going. Uh, that's one of the roles that this SRTR group plays that I think is very helpful, is they help to visualize and summarize and kind of make tractable this blizzard of facts that are available about who's getting transplants. I can only imagine the stress of watching a data visualization of where the different kidneys are going at different times or other organs of liver or lung geography. <laughs> Our next question is from Amanda Lenhart. Is there any way to apply pressure to create this type of process to private applications of algorithms in healthcare? Thinking here about how insurance companies may ration or modulate access to certain types of care. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, insurance regulation is such an interesting field. There are state boards, for instance, that, um, that 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 control the rates of different kinds of in insurance. Actually, I'm thinking of Barbara Kiviat and her work on car insurance and basically taking moral, morally salient factors out of the credit predictions that are used to set car insurance rates. So legislatures have said if the reason you defaulted on your loan is because you know you had a terminally ill family member, then it can't be counted against you. That's car insurance and not medical. But I think it's a sort of parallel phenomenon in some ways, which is sort of uh, ethical regulation or ethics driven intervention in how insurance decisions get get made. And I, I do think that this could be uh, a useful model. I mean, one one thing to say about what makes the transplant case special and might make the might make it hard to transplant this bureaucratic procedure into other domains is that, uh, organs are not for sale. They're not. They're a non-market resource, and they're donated. And so, having a system that inspires public confidence is seen as mission critical. And I would say, by the way, that it's not obvious to me that our policy of not ever rewarding someone financially for donating a kidney is the wisest possible policy. I find the debate about uh, whether or not to have, for instance, single payer government incentives available, I think, is a very interesting. Uh, and separate conver conversation. We're moving now towards AI and machine learning in a way strictly from algorithms in our next upcoming questions. From Edna Egal, we have, while the most recent update to the kidney allocation algorithm seems to address black box concerns, how do you think AI advances will impact regulatory and governance mechanisms for autonomous machines and complex algorithmic systems like this one? Yeah. I. I'm optimistic on this, I think, for the following reason. No matter how complicated the algorithm is, there is a human somewhere that has to decide how it's going to work, whether or not its, it's, its choices are acceptable. So for instance, if it's a self-driving car type of a scenario, somebody who works for the company that makes self-driving cars is iterating over different adjustments to that algorithm, is assessing in some way whether it's doing the right thing or the wrong thing. There has to be some place uh, where some human 
is deciding what's acceptable. And so I think the, the drive to regulate is in essence, the drive to open the door to wherever that conference room is. And my sense is that, and that whiteboard where people are sketching, do we want it to work this way or that way? And my sense is that no matter how complex the algorithms get, there's always a whiteboard somewhere, it's out there. And the challenge for regulators and for people who share this interest in how these things are governed is to figure out how to get into that room. I love the idea of starting each interrogation of algorithmic opacity with the question, where's the whiteboard? <laughs> yeah. Our next question from Henry Gibbon, Giblin is, in your opinion, is algorithmic governance possible in an automated machine learning environment? I mean, I, I, I do think uh, that this there's, there's a whiteboard somewhere as a part of my answer. So there's a way for humans to understand what's happening. Uh, the other part is there's, I think, uh, that true understanding requires infrastructure. It requires, it's not enough just to disclose some stuff. You've got to have a community of experts that knows how to understand what's going on. You've got to have uh, efforts at sense making, uh, uh, to use kind of a data and society flavored word, uh, that, that's, that's, you know, where, where people are analyzing and are saying, okay, what does this mean? What is this telling us? And I think one thing that is very helpful in the transplant case, and that would I think be helpful in other cases, is to have some of that analysis work, because it is work, it's effort and resource intensive, be, 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 be done once and then shared widely, so that if I want to participate, I don't have to reinvent the wheel and employ my own building full of statisticians in order to discern what's, what's really going on. I'm gonna combine two questions that sort of capture the gist of each other um, from Jumana Abu Ghazeli and Kamala Hayward Rotini. Um, both thank you for your talk. And we, we want to know a little bit more about how the ethical questions can be addressed at the level of algorithm development, or in other words, how should the people in the room with the whiteboard be trained and what should they know? What qualifies them? Right, I think that's a, that's a great question. And there's, I, I feel like impacted communities is kind of a pat answer to this question in a way, because there's a, a grain of truth to it, but I think it's complicated. Like, who is the community is a hard question. Uh, so, you know, people will say, uh, you know, you should hear from patients. And then we could ask, well, which patients are you likely to hear from? Who has time to go to a committee meeting on a Tuesday evening? Probably someone with relatively you know, a lot of access to care and, and resources and so on. And, and similarly, I think, you know, even getting input from doctors in the case of transplant that is, that is useful or from, or, from, or from nurses, there's almost this kind of, I think this anthropology piece where you have to, and I, Alex, you know, you're a, you're a model in, in this is you sort of have to go be among the people that are where the thing is happening in order to even have, I think, a completely or, or a well-grounded opinion about whose input is needed at the table. I don't think you can easily discern a priori, you know, from far away, like whose interests are at stake or what the situation looks like. So I would suspect that this debate over who belongs at the table is itself something that needs to happen kind of particularly for each, each given system. And I think if I were kind of being parachuted in as a data scientist into a completely unfamiliar context, what I would, what I would look for or would hope to generate would be an informed conversation about, okay, what is this like for the people who are involved in it, who are impacted by it? Like, who are those communities? And really, and almost a kind of snowball sampling where you go out and you, you have some idea about who might have something to say about this. You talk to them and part of what you ask is who else might have something to say about this? And you sort of build some picture. We only have time for a few more questions. I'm going to ask two of them combined and then return finally to Leif Hancock's Lee's question, which takes us back to the center stage of COVID. Um, before we get there, the burning questions we have right now are around how to build successful collaborations. Um, is there something this story teaches us about how to structure a successful collaboration between technical and lay folks is a question that Ben Bloom Smith is asking. And Amy Chen is adding, 
Is there anything unique you feel was there to the culture of the world, people working on kidney transplants, uh, policymakers, activists, patients, that you think made for this type of collaborative and progressive process? Yeah, I, I would say one thing about transplant and, and kidney medicine is that people on dialysis have lots of time where they're in the medical physically every 12 hours every week in the medical establishment, plenty of time to kind of like think about and work on. There's a lot of like face time that, pe that people have. And these committees, by the way, uh, you know, that we're meeting to deliberate, there was a fair amount of in-person meeting that happened. And I think face to face, it's harder to like dehumanize or abstract away from what somebody else is thinking or saying. And, I, and these were sustained over many years, these discussions. And sometimes, for instance, I would talk to an activist who had worked on this and find out that their personal physician was one of the physicians who was doing policy making. So it's sort of, you know, um, not a huge universe of people. And I think the, the uh, sustained interaction over many years of particular people with each other and the relationships that were part of that, I think was, was important to this. So all we need is time and face. <laughs> Our next question is from Leif Hancocks Lee. Uh, I like the idea of algorithms directing moral attention. Going back to the COVID vaccine situation, what do you think are some offstage questions that the dominant way of framing distribution has mm -hmm. neglected? Ooh, Ooh, that's a great question. And I'll say, I'll stall for time by saying, I always feel disappointed when STS folks say this is, you know, raises values issues or has assumptions. And I always want to know what are the assumptions, you know, uh, it's a great challenge for all of us. I would say that uh, there are questions about who bears the risk of going first that maybe are not as much in focus. Um, there are I think questions about what to do with the greater safety that's created once a significant part of the population has vaccination. For instance, you know, um, are, will there be heightened pressure then for people to go back to work in ways that are still hazardous for them because the hazard has been diminished? Uh, uh, and I think also how long does, you know, how long do these initial promising results you know, uh, hold up for. But if I, if, you know, if I could, instead of individually trying to do that, if I could kind of make all of us take a few minutes and think about, well, you know, what are we taking for granted here? I, I feel like it's a fruitful exercise. I think in particular, your work on how trust is facilitated in the medical and governance establishment to equally or equitably distribute these valuable and yet non-monetary <laughs> assets, these kidneys and lungs and liver, um, and think about how that might appeal to vaccine distributions and how to galvanize people to both trust in the process and in the vaccines themselves. Um, those would certainly be thinking points for the future. I think we're rounding out on our data by today. So David, I want to ask if there are any final remarks you want to leave us with. Oh, just uh, expressing strong gratitude to everybody who was here. Uh, there'll be uh, a paper of some kind. One of the challenges with this work has been to figure out how to position it in a discipline or what exactly uh, to publish, but I'm very hopeful that in the next six months or so, the substance of all this work will be citable and, and public. And I'm sure data and society can help to keep interested folks uh, you know, in the loop in one way or another. Um, and I would just say that uh, if you want to talk about this uh, set of work or ideas, I'm thinking about them very actively and always appreciate that. So uh, feel free to reach out. Thank you. I've had the early pleasure of reading this paper and it's absolutely fascinating. Everyone will be very excited to see it in print. For now, I'm going to conclude our session today. Uh, by thanking you, David, for your excellent work and presentation, and for again thanking CJ and Rigo and Eli who have helped to put on this amazing event. Thank you so much for all of your efforts. And thanks to you all for joining us today. This was our final public event of the year. We hope that other years are better. <laughs> and stay tuned for more exciting programming ahead.
The paper for this presentation will be coming out in the spring, as David mentioned. And if you need to cite it in advance, please contact events at datasociety.net. And finally, please take two seconds to complete the short survey at the end of the call. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you.